1. Mencius speaks clumsily. Once, the king of the state of Song asked Mencius's student, Tian Q, Why does your master, Mencius, do everything well but speak somewhat clumsily? Tian Q replied, Before I speak about my teacher, let me tell you two short stories. Go ahead. There was a man from the state of Song who went to the state of Zhang to sell pearls. He used the finest wood, magnolia, to make the box for the pearls. Then he perfumed the box with expensive fragrances and decorated it with intricate carvings and inlaid with jade and precious stones. As a result, the people of Zhang bought only the box and not the pearls. This is like being good at selling the box but not the pearls. That year, when the king of Qin married off his daughter to a prince from the state of Jin, he chose seventy beautiful maids to accompany his daughter. Upon reaching Jin, the prince was more fascinated by the maids, and the bride was neglected. This is like being good at sending maids but not at marrying off a daughter. Now, comparing speaking abilities, a person who only speaks eloquently often leads others to pay attention only to the words, neglecting their meaning. My teacher's teaching spread the virtues from ancient times, discussing the moral principles of life, meant to guide people. If his words were too ornate, people would focus only on the style and forget the moral principles within, similar to the man from Song Selling Pearls or the king of Kin marrying off his daughter. Therefore, Mencius does not prefer ornate language. 2. Valuing Objects Over People Qi Jinggong liked to use hawks for hunting rabbits. Once, Zhu Nu accidentally let the hawk escape, and Jinggong ordered him to be executed. When Yanzi heard about this, he came to see Jinggong. Zhu Nu has committed three major offenses, and it would be easy to kill him. Please allow me to list his crimes before you execute him. Is that okay? Qi Jinggong replied, Go ahead. Yanzi pointed at Zhu Nu and said, Zhu Nu, you were supposed to care for the king's hawk, but you let it escape. That's the first crime. Because of your mistake, the king has to execute someone. That's the second crime. And after you are killed, all the nobles will criticize the king for valuing the hawk over his subjects. That's the third crime. Hearing this, Qi Jinggong quickly said to Yanzi, Say no more. I understand your point. Three examples. King Jin Ping spoke to his minister, Su Kuang. I am now seventy years old and always feel that my education is lacking. Although I love reading and learning from the wise, it's too late at my age. Is it really too late? Su Kuang said. If it's late, why not light a candle? I am being serious, yet you joke around. Su Quang replied, As a servant, how could I joke with the king? What I mean is, if a person studies well when young, their future will be bright as the morning sun. If they study well in middle age, it's like the sun at noon, and in old age it's merely the light of a candle. Though not as bright as the sun, it still shines brighter than darkness. How Views on Fathers Change Over Time At seven years old, Dad knows everything. At fourteen years old, well, sometimes he might be wrong. At twenty years old, Dad seems outdated, his ideas aren't modern. At twenty-five years old, the old man doesn't know anything, always asking questions, hopelessly outdated. At thirty-five years old, if only Dad had been as talented as I am now, he'd surely be wealthy today. At 45 years old, I wonder if I should discuss this with the old man. Maybe he'll have a good suggestion. At 55 years old, it's a shame Dad passed away. Truly, his views were wise. At 60 years old, poor Dad, he was a learned scholar who knew everything. Too bad I only realized it too late. 3. The tiger is dead, the wolves remain. There was a student named N.H.A. Thok who didn't want to become a government official. Instead, he decided to move his family deep into the forest to live. 
A tiger often crouched outside his fence, watching his house intently. N.H.A. Thach warned his family, We need to be cautious of this tiger and prevent it from getting inside. He built a wall around the house and planted many thorny bushes outside the wall. As soon as the sun rose, they would beat drums and gongs to scare the tiger away. And when bandits came down from the mountains, they lit a big fire to keep the tiger at bay, as it was afraid of fire. After a year, everyone in the house was still safe. However, during a cold winter night, the hungry tiger thought of breaking into N.H.A. Thatch's house to take a pig. Despite its fear of fire, it was so hungry that it took a risk. The tiger leaped over the fire, scratched at the wall, but the thorns on the bushes injured it and it fell back into the fire, getting badly burnt. It screamed and ran away, causing chaos among the other forest animals, but it could not get into N.H.A. Thach's house. A few days later, the tiger died of starvation. N.H.A. Thok and his family were very relieved and said, Now we don't have to worry anymore. Gradually, the fence began to deteriorate and no one bothered to repair it. The wall collapsed in one corner due to rain but was left unattended. The thorny bushes died off and they stopped lighting fires. Suddenly, one night, another ferocious beast broke into the house and killed all of N.H.A. Thatch's family. Later, whenever people talked about this story, they would say, N.H.A. Thach only prepared for the tiger, but dangers aren't limited to just one. The real problem was their lack of continued vigilance. 4. Three Regrets Jack Thuck was a stubborn man who always thought he was right and liked to do the opposite of what others did. He used to farm in the north of Kwai San, planting rice on dry mountain slopes and other crops at the damp, low foothills. His friend disagreed, saying, Rice likes wet conditions and should be planted at the foothill. Crops that tolerate drought should go on the slopes. You're going against their natural growing conditions and it won't yield good results. Jack Thuck ignored his advice, and after ten years, his family couldn't even eat their fill. Only then did he notice how his friend planted successfully, rice in the wet areas and crops on the dry land yielding plenty. So he apologized to his friend. I was wrong before. I should have listened to you sooner. Later, Jack Thuck moved to Von Thuong to try his hand at business. Thinking his past failures were due to not following others, he started imitating what everyone else did in the marketplace. When people bought something, he bought it. When they sold, he sold. His friends advised him, just following others won't work. You'll always be behind. A good businessman stocks unique items that others don't have. So when the chance arises, you can make a big profit. Jack Thuk didn't listen, and after another decade, he was so broke he couldn't even sustain his business. Remembering his friend's advice from ten years earlier, he apologized again. You were right, and I regret not listening. Finally, Jack Thuk and a friend went fishing in the E.C. Near a whirlpool, his friend warned him, Don't go any further, there's a whirlpool ahead and we won't be able to escape. Thinking there were more fish ahead, Jack Thuck ignored the warning and continued, only to have their boat caught in the whirlpool. Luckily, a large fish struggling nearby created big waves that helped them escape. By the time he felt remorse, he was already old and frail. He sought out his old friend, bowed twice and pointed to the sky, declaring, I was too stubborn before. Now I swear to change. His friend smiled and said, You're old now. What good will changing do at this age? 5. The Expensive Peacock Painting A king once heard about a talented oil painter and decided to visit him. I want you to paint a peacock for me, the king requested. A year later, he returned. Where's the peacock painting I commissioned? the king asked. Your peacock will be ready shortly replied the artist. He quickly sketched a beautiful peacock on a piece of paper. The king was pleased but surprised by the price. It took just a little time and seemed so effortless, 
Why is it so expensive? he asked. The artist then showed the king around his studio, which was filled with numerous sketches of peacocks. The price is quite fair, the artist explained. Though it seems I use little effort now, it actually took a lot of my time and energy to prepare for this painting over the past year. 6. The Secret to Longevity At the base of Mount Tai, there is a rock named Three Laugh Stone. Legend has it that three elderly men, each over 100 years old, often gathered at this rock to exercise and discuss the past and present. They always appeared joyful and vibrant. One day, they shared their secrets to a long life. The first elder said, Have a glass of wine before meals. The second elder said, Go for a walk after meals. The third elder said, My wife is really annoying. They all laughed heartily, which is how the rock got its name. Their secrets to longevity were simple, yet somewhat puzzling. Indeed, their advice holds wisdom. A moderate amount of wine can potentially extend one's life. Walking after meals can also be beneficial. And the comment about the annoying wife was just a joke implying that sexual desires naturally decrease with age and should not be overindulged. Their wise words remind us to maintain balance in all aspects of life and to keep everything in moderation. 7. The Friendship of Quan and Bao Quan Zhong was a skilled general during the spring and autumn period who served under King Tuan of Qi, helping make the state of Qi a dominant power. Bao Xu Ya, also known as Bao Xu, was a famously intelligent person. They were very good friends. Initially, Quan Zhong served the son of Duke Xiang, Prince Zhu, while Bao Xu Ya served Prince Zhu's brother, Prince Xiao Bai. After Duke Xiang passed away, the ministers decided to bring Prince Zhu back to ascend the throne. Fearing that Prince Xiao Bai might return first, Quan Zhong chased after him and shot an arrow. Prince Xiao Bai pretended to be hit by the arrow, deceiving Quan Zhong, and then he and Bao Xu Ya quickly rode back to Qi, where Xiao Bai became King Tuan. Once King Tuan took the throne, he wanted to appoint Bao Xu Ya as his prime minister. However, Bao Xu Ya recommended Quan Zhong, who was in prison at the time. King Tuan agreed to Bao Xu Ya's suggestion and appointed Quan Zhong as prime minister. Later, Quan Zhong governed Qi and aided King Tuan in becoming a leading power. Quan Zhong later reflected, When I was poor and worked with Bao Xu even though I took more than my share, Bao never thought I was greedy. He knew it was because I was poor. I often made plans for Bao, but sometimes it led him into deeper troubles. Yet Bao never thought I was stupid. He understood that sometimes things just don't work out. I was imprisoned three times by the king, but Bao never thought less of me. He knew I hadn't found my moment yet. I fought in three battles and lost all three, running away. But Bao never thought I was a coward. He knew I had to take care of my elderly mother. When Prince Ju failed and died and I was imprisoned and humiliated, Bao never thought I was disgraceful. He knew it wasn't about the small things or about maintaining a reputation. My parents gave me life, but Bao truly understood me. Before Quan Zhong died, King Tuan asked if Bao Xu Ya could replace him. Quan Zhong said it was not possible claiming Bao was too kind and couldn't harshly punish the wicked. Handing power to him could harm both King Tuan and Bao himself. After hearing this, Bao was not upset at not being recommended. Instead, he was happy, saying only Quan Zhong truly understood him. 8. Gratitude and Revenge A deer was walking through the forest when it suddenly heard cries for help. It ran toward the sound and found a wolf trapped under a fallen tree. The deer asked, Are you okay, wolf? Stop asking and use your antlers to lift this tree off me so I can get out, the wolf replied. I'm not sure I can lift it, the deer said. Nevertheless, it tried its best, 
and finally managed to lift the tree, freeing the wolf. The first thing the wolf did was check for any broken bones, and then, happily jumping around, it said to the deer, Deer, now I want to eat you. What? Are you serious? The deer gasped in fear and said, Don't you feel ashamed? I just saved your life, and now you want to eat me. True, you saved my life, and I'm thankful, but now I'm hungry, so I need to eat you. They argued for a while and finally decided to ask a bear to settle the dispute. They told the bear the whole story. The bear thought for a moment and said to the deer, You saved the wolf, and now the wolf wants to eat you. That's not right. But from another point of view, the wolf has a point because it's hungry. Let's go to the fallen tree and see how you saved the wolf, then I can decide, the bear suggested. The deer and wolf agreed and they all went back to the fallen tree. The deer used all its strength to lift the tree and then dropped it back onto the wolf. At that moment, the bear said, Lift the tree with your antlers to save the wolf. The deer replied, I've lifted this tree twice today already, and now I'm too tired. The bear said, If you can't lift it, then don't. But how am I supposed to solve this situation now? Don't be angry, deer. It's not that I don't support you. I'm out of ideas. After saying this, the bear walked away. Really out of ideas, said the deer, and also walked away. So the wolf was crushed to death by the tree. There are many instances of gratitude and revenge in our lives. Some respond to kindness with kindness and to wrongdoing with retribution. This has become a way of life for many. Whether it's showing gratitude or seeking revenge, we should be thankful for the life we've been given and for those who help us when we face difficulties. 9. Life is like climbing a mountain. A young man who loved mountain climbing went to seek advice from a renowned mountain climbing expert. During their conversation, the young man asked a question, What if we're halfway up the mountain and it suddenly starts raining? The expert replied, You should keep going to the top. Puzzled, the young man asked, Why should we head to the top? Isn't the weather worse up there? The expert explained, Yes, the rain might be heavier at the top, but it's not life-threatening. Going back down, the weather might be milder, but you risk landslides, which could be fatal. He added seriously, when it comes to storms, avoiding them might seem safer, but facing them head-on could actually be your best chance for survival. 10. The Road Ahead It was pitch dark outside. On the street, people hurried by. A steady tapping sound came from the wooden cane in the hand of a blind man. A passerby warned him, You're heading towards a dead end. The blind man replied, I need to go all the way to see what it's like. He did not stop, continuing forward. The tapping sound faded into the distance until it disappeared completely. 11. For everyone. A little girl was taken by her father to a rose garden for a walk. She took a deep breath and said, Dad, can you smell that? These roses are so fragrant. Before her father could respond, they heard an old lady standing on the porch say, If you both like them, feel free to pick a few. The father and daughter picked the most beautiful roses, thanked the old lady, and complimented how beautiful her flowers were. The old lady replied, I grow these flowers so everyone can enjoy them, not for myself, as I am blind. 12. Master Fisherman In the state of So, there was a master fisherman named Chiem Ha, who fished unlike anyone else. He used a single thread as his fishing line, a bent grass blade as his hook, and a bamboo stick as his rod. When fishing, he baited the hook with just half a grain of rice. In no time, Chiem Ha would fill a whole cart with fish. Strangely, despite catching so many fish, his fishing gear never deformed. The line didn't break, the hook didn't straighten, and the rod didn't bend. King So, curious about Chiem Ha's exceptional fishing skills, 
invited him to the palace to learn his secrets. Chiem Ha replied, My deceased father once told me about a master archer from our land named Bo Thu Tu. With a gentle pull of his bowstring, his arrow would whiz through the air, often hitting two golden birds flying in the sky with a single shot. He said it was because the archer concentrated and used even force. Thus, I adopted his method for fishing. After five years of practice, I mastered this technique. When I fish by the river, I focus solely on fishing, clearing my mind of other thoughts, and maintaining a calm spirit, freeing it from dark thoughts. When I cast my rod, I use just the right amount of force, neither too hard nor too soft, without disturbing the surrounding environment. Therefore, the fish think my bait is just debris or foam, and they confidently swim up to eat it. By fishing, I practice controlling the hard with the soft, the light with the heavy. Both the stories of Bo Thu Tu's archery and my fishing illustrate a common principle. Whatever you do, you must do it wholeheartedly and meticulously, using your heart to judge and applying objective laws to master it. Only then can you achieve remarkable results and succeed in your work. Hey everyone, your comments truly matter, offering insights and motivation to others and uplifting our creative team at Lighthouse of Wisdom Channel. Sharing your thoughts and experiences enriches our community. So let's get the conversation started below and help illuminate our path with your wisdom. 13. Keeping a Bird Outside the city of Luo, there was a unique sea bird that no one had ever seen before, so people thought it was a magical bird. The king ordered his men to capture it, and once they did, it was treated like a distinguished guest in the royal palace. However, the bird looked very sad. How can I make this bird happy? The king worried. Suddenly, he had an idea. He decided to have musicians play music for the bird and ordered his chefs to prepare a feast for it. But this well-meaning act scared the bird instead. It refused to eat or drink, became anxious, and flapped around in fear. After two days, the seabird died from fright. 14. Scholar Meets Bandits Scholar Ingu Kuyet, known for his deep knowledge, once encountered bandits on the road. Stop! Your money? or your life, the bandits demanded, blocking the path with drawn swords. Gu Kuyet smiled, stepped down from his carriage, left all his money and the carriage for the bandits, and cheerfully continued on his way as if nothing had happened. This puzzled the bandits, as people usually resist or beg when robbed. They had never met someone like Gu Kuyet and followed him to ask, We've taken your possessions, why aren't you upset? A gentleman shouldn't harm himself over material things, Ngu Kuyet calmly replied. After he left, one bandit remarked, He's really a wise man. Another said, This scholar is so learned, if he goes to the king of Zhao, he'll surely be valued. Then if he remembers this robbery and tells the king, the king will send troops to kill us. We should kill him now to prevent future trouble. The bandits agreed and chased down and killed Ungu Kuyet. Hearing this, a man from the state of Yan warned his family, don't act like Ungu Kuyet if you face bandits. Later, his younger brother, when in the state of Kin, indeed faced bandits at Hamcock Pass. Remembering his brother's advice, he fought back. The bandits were numerous and eventually took his bag. Trying to retrieve his bag, he followed and flattered the bandits. Annoyed, they said, We spared your life, and still you nag us, risking exposing us. We'll just kill you to avoid more trouble. And they killed him, along with his companions. 15. The Shadow There was a man who found his shadow extremely annoying and wanted to get rid of it, but no matter what he did, he couldn't separate it from himself. Whether he tried hitting it with a stick or jumping into water, the shadow stayed right beside him, unchanged. A scholar saw the man sitting dejectedly and approached him to ask, What's troubling you so much? There's nothing in this world that can't be solved. Tell me about it. Maybe I can help. So, 
The man explained how he had been trying to chase away his shadow and how stubborn it was. What should I do? The man asked sadly. Oh, the scholar said slowly, if you really don't want your shadow anymore, just stand under that tree over there. 16. The Screech of the Owl Hu Tzu was the prime minister of the state of Luang, and Zhuangzi wanted to visit him. Someone told Hui Tzu, Zhuangzi's visit is not just a casual one. He intends to replace you as prime minister. Alarmed, Hu Tzu ordered a three-day and night search throughout the city. Hearing that Hu Tzu wanted to drive him away, Zhuangzi was even more determined to visit. Upon meeting, he said to Hui Tzu, On my way here, I heard a rather amusing story. Would you like to hear it? Hu Tzu asked, What story? Zhuangzi replied, In the south, there's a bird called the Yuan So, which loves tranquility. The Yuan So flies from the southern sea to the northern sea. It only perches on the tong tree, only eats the purest berries, and only drinks from fresh springs. Meanwhile, an owl was picking at a dead rat and saw the Yuan So flying by. It looked up and screeched angrily, afraid that the Yuan So was there to steal its meal. Are you using the title of Prime Minister to scare me now? 17. Skull When Zhuangzi was visiting the state of So, he spotted a human skull in the weeds by the roadside. The wind blew through it making a whistling sound. Zhuangzi hit the skull with a whip and asked it, Did you bring this upon yourself by doing something terrible and unjust? Or did you meet your end because your country was destroyed and your enemies killed you like this? Or perhaps you did something shameful, causing your family grief so deep that it killed you? Did hunger, cold, or thirst claim you? Or did you simply die of old age? After saying this, Zhuangzi felt tired, lay down on the grass, and used the skull as a pillow. At midnight, the skull came to him in a dream and said, I heard what you said during the day. You speak of humiliations, losses, hunger, and old age, all the sorrows of the living. Death ends all that. Do you want to know the joy that comes after death? Zhuangzi replied, Yes, tell me. The skull said, after death, there are no authorities to govern you, no need to worry about the seasons. You're free and live as long as the heavens and earth. Even kings can't compare to this joy. Zhuangzi didn't believe it and said, If I called the deity who oversees life and death to bring you back to your parents, spouse, friends, would you like that? No, 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 the skull replied, terrified. I cherish this freedom and fear the busy, competitive life among the living. 18. Cockfighting There was a man who was very skilled at training fighting roosters. The king invited him to the palace to train a rooster. Ten days later, the king asked, Is the rooster well trained yet? The man replied, Not yet. This rooster only uses its crow to scare other roosters. After another ten days, the king inquired again, Can the rooster fight now? The man said, Not yet. It gets too excited and rushes to fight at the sound of another rooster. A month passed and the king asked, Is it ready now? The man answered, Still not. It just glares when it sees another one. Then ten more days passed and the king asked him again, Is the rooster good now? This time it is, said the trainer. Now when it hears another rooster, it remains unbothered, calm like a wooden rooster. It wins confidently, and the other roosters turn and run at the sight of it, hardly daring to challenge it. 19. Talent and Lack of Talent Once, Zhuangzi and his students were walking in the mountains when they came across a large, bushy tree. A woodcutter was sitting under the tree but chose not to cut it down. Curious, Zhuangzi asked him why. The woodcutter explained that the tree was useless. Hearing this, Zhuangzi turned to his students and said, This tree survives because its wood is good for nothing 
and that's why it has lasted so long. Later, Zhuangzi visited a friend's house where he was warmly welcomed. The friend instructed his servant to prepare a meal using quail. The servant asked, Should I cook the quail that sings or the one that doesn't? The friend replied, Cook the one that doesn't sing. The next day, Zhuangzi's students questioned him, puzzled by the previous day's events. They noted, Yesterday, the tree in the mountain survives because it is useless, while the quail dies because it is useless. If you were in charge, how would you handle this? Zhuangzi smiled and said, Talent and lack of talent are the same. Neither can avoid troubles. If you want to live peacefully, you must understand how to balance between being talented and being seen as useless. 20. A Chain of Predation Reflections from Zhuangzi's Garden A praying mantis catches a cicada and a sparrow is ready to strike. While walking in his garden, Zhuangzi saw a bird fly in from the south. Its wings spanned seven feet and its eyes were as big as a dragon's. The bird flew past, brushing against Zhuangzi's forehead and landed on a tree in the garden. Zhuangzi wondered, what kind of bird is this? It had large wings, yet it didn't fly far, and its eyes were big but not sharp. Zhuangzi quietly pulled a bull from his back and stealthily moved into the fruit garden, aiming to shoot the bird. Just then, he noticed a cicada happily singing on a branch, a mantis ready to strike at the cicada, and the strange bird, which had appeared behind the mantis, preparing to eat it. However, the bird was unaware of Zhuangzi, who was standing below with his bow. Seeing this scene, Zhuangzi exclaimed, Oh, the slaughter among creatures driven by mutual attraction leads to tragedy. Disturbed, Zhuangzi returned home, closed his doors, and did not step outside for three months. 21. Scholars' Robe and Wisdom once the proud king of Lu boasted to the philosopher Zhuangzi, saying, Our kingdom of Lu has many wise scholars. Zhuangzi replied, There are actually very few true scholars in Lu. The king disagreed. That's not true. Everywhere in Lu you see people wearing the robes of scholars. How can you say there are so few? Zhuangzi explained, I've heard that a true scholar wears a round cap symbolizing their knowledge of astronomy square shoes representing their understanding of geography, and carries a jade ring with a flaw to show their moral integrity and decisiveness. However, not all who wear scholars' robes necessarily possess such knowledge. The king was skeptical, so Zhuangzi suggested, if you don't believe it, issue a decree. Execute anyone who wears scholars' robes but is not a scholar. The king issued the decree and within five days, no one in Lu dared to wear the robes anymore. A few days later, a man wearing scholar's robe stood before the palace. The king invited him in and found him indeed knowledgeable about astronomy and geography, and he understood the state's major affairs well. Zhuangzi told the king, In such a vast kingdom as Lu, there is only this one true scholar. Would you still say there are many? Fisherman's Discovery Fishermen, casting their nets, pulled a jar from the deep sea. Inside was a note that read, Everyone, please come save me, I am here. The Dragon King has imprisoned me on a deserted island, and I am waiting on the shore for you to rescue me. Please save me, I am here. There was no date on the note. It's probably too late now, one fisherman said. The location is unclear. The ocean is vast. Who knows which direction to search, another added. It's not too late, nor is it far. Every island is here, the third fisherman remarked. And so they felt unbound and reflective. Such is often the nature of truth. 22. The Beggar and the Dewdrop One morning, a beggar was walking down the road. He shifted a rice bag from his left hand to his right and was about to brush the dust off his hands when a large, sparkling dewdrop fell into his palm. 
The beggar looked at it for a moment, lifted his hand to his lips and spoke to the dewdrop. Do you know what I'm going to do with you? You're going to swallow me, replied the dewdrop. It seems you're even more unfortunate than I am, having your fate in someone else's hands. You're wrong, the dewdrop said. I don't understand what being unfortunate is. I once fell on a large carnation bud and made it bloom beautifully. Now I am nurturing another life. This is my greatest joy and fortune, and I have no regrets. Suddenly, the beggar stopped walking. 23. The Paths of Others A person wanted to cross a swamp, but there was no clear path, so they had to carefully step one foot at a time. It was tough. They jumped left and right, and soon enough they sank into the mud. Another person also wanted to cross the swamp and saw the first person's footsteps. They thought, someone has already walked here, so it must be safe if I follow these steps. After a few successful steps, they felt confident, but eventually, they too fell into the mud. A third person, seeing the footsteps of the previous two, followed without hesitation and met a similar fate. Then another person came along, saw the tracks of many others, and thought, this must be the way through the swamp. So many have passed this way. Just follow them and I'll surely get across. They took big steps forward, but in the end, they also sank into the mud. The paths on earth are not always smooth just because others have traveled them. Following in someone else's footsteps doesn't always lead to progress and sometimes leads right into a trap. 24. Wrong Direction There was a man who kept driving his carriage northward. His friend asked him where he was headed, and he replied that he wanted to go to the state of So. But so is to the south. Why are you heading north? His friend reminded him. It doesn't matter which way I go. My carriage is really good, he responded. Your carriage is good, the friend tried to remind him, but you're going the wrong way. No worries. What matters is that I have money, he said. I know you have money, but you should be heading south, the friend insisted. North or south, it doesn't matter when my driver is this skilled. What's there to fear? The driver was indeed very skilled, and with a crack of his whip, the carriage sped off, kicking up a cloud of dust and soon disappeared. The friend shook his head and said, The better his conditions, the farther away he gets from so. 25. Different Perspectives Mon Khan brought a friend to meet a very famous official. After the friend left, the official told Mon Khan, your friend has three bad qualities. He laughs when he sees me, which shows he's careless. He doesn't mention his teacher when he talks, which is like betraying his teacher. And he doesn't talk the first time he meets someone, which shows a lack of understanding of proper behavior. Mon Khan smiled and replied, He laughed when he saw you because he is friendly and approachable. He doesn't talk about his teacher because he is independent and not clique. He doesn't talk on first meeting because he is straightforward and honest with everyone. 26. The Courage of the Thief General Tzu Fat of the state of so greatly valued talented individuals and ensured each person who followed him possessed a unique skill. One day, a thief approached General Tzu Fat and said, I heard you appreciate talented people. I don't have a regular job, but I am skilled at stealing. Do you value this skill as well? Upon hearing this, General Tzu Fat quickly showed his respect and said, Having someone as skilled as you on my team is truly an honor. However, those around him advised, Being polite to a thief like this is unreasonable. General Tzu Fat replied, You don't understand the principle here. Later, when the state of Tay attacked the state of So, General Tzu Fat led his army but lost three battles in a row, with the enemy growing stronger with each encounter. The officials and generals of So were desperate for a strategy. At that time, the thief offered his skills to General Tzu Fat, who promptly accepted and sent him on a mission. That night, 
the thief sneaked into the tea general's camp and stole his tent curtains. The next day, General Tzu Pot sent someone with the curtains and a letter to the tea general stating, My soldiers found your curtains while gathering firewood and have returned them. The following night, the thief stole the general's pillow, which was also returned. On the third night, he stole the general's hairpin, and again, it was returned. The T army, alarmed by these events and fearing that their heads might be next, advised a retreat. Consequently, orders were given to withdraw to the state of Tapapsu. 27. Fire Rescue There was a person from the town of Triu whose house caught fire. After he managed to escape, he wanted to go back upstairs to put out the fire but didn't have a ladder. So, he went over to his neighbor's house to borrow one. After getting dressed and tidying up, he walked over to the neighbor's place. Upon arrival, he bowed three times to his neighbor and then followed him inside. The neighbor offered him food and drinks. The man slowly finished his drink, then offered his neighbor three rounds in return. After they finished drinking, the neighbor asked, What brings you here today? Only then did the man mention, A great disaster has struck my home. The upper floor is on fire and it's burning fiercely. I need water to put it out, but unfortunately, I don't have a way to reach it. We don't know what to do. We can only cry and watch it burn. I heard you have a ladder, so I took the liberty of disturbing you. Could I possibly borrow it? Hearing this, the neighbor stomped his foot and said, Why are you so traditional? He quickly went with the man to bring the ladder for the firefighting effort. However, by the time they returned, the house had burned down to ashes. 28. The Cat and the Mouse In the country of V, there lived a man named Thuk Thi, who loved cats so much that he had over a hundred of them in his house. The mice in his and his neighbor's houses were all eaten by the cats. This is not good. This is not good, he exclaimed, as the cats had no more mice to eat and cried out all day. Thuk Thi had to buy meat for them to eat daily. Over time, the cats reproduced, and multiple generations of cats lived off meat, forgetting that mice existed in the world. They only knew to cry out when hungry, and food would appear. After eating, they would just walk around, look about, or lie in the sun. In the southern part of the city, a scholar lived in a house overrun with mice. During the day, the mice roamed in packs, gnawing at everything in the house. Hearing about Thuk Thi's many cats, the scholar borrowed a few to catch the mice. However, when the cats saw the mice, with their upright ears, shiny black eyes, and reddish fur making a chaotic noise, they didn't know what to do and didn't dare to catch them. Instead, they just followed the mice around. The scholar, very upset, threw the cats among the mice. The terrified cats panicked and ran in circles. When the mice realized the cats were harmless, they gathered courage and bit the cat's legs. In pain, the cats yelped and fled. 29. The Usefulness of Being Useless A carpenter and his apprentice were walking by a massive tree in Cook Vienne, in the state of Key, when they noticed a crowd performing a ritual under it. The tree was so large that its branches could shelter thousands of chariots, and its trunk was nearly a hundred feet in circumference. However, the carpenter didn't pay any attention to the tree. Curious, the apprentice asked, Master, since I've started learning from you, I've never seen such a fine tree. Why don't you care about it and just keep walking? The master replied, Forget it. It's just a useless tree. If used to build a boat, it would be too heavy. If used to make a coffin, it would soon rot. If made into household tools, they would be too fragile to hold anything. If made into doors or windows, they would be too light and porous. If used as beams, they would be prone to termite damage. This type of tree can't be turned into anything useful. That's why it has been able to live so long and grow so large. That night, the tree appeared in the carpenter's dream and said, What do you compare me with? 
Trees with beautiful patterns are cut down by people to make tools. Fruit trees like orange, lemon, and kumquat are cut down after a few seasons. They are useful to humans, but this also shortens their lifespan. You think I am useless, but that is precisely what has been most beneficial to me. If I had been useful in your eyes, I would not have lived to such an old age, nor would I have had the chance to live till now. 30. Temporary Measures and Teaching Confucius had been living in the state of Tai for three years when the state of Ngo attacked the state of Tron. The state of So came to Tran's aid and set up camp in Than Fu village. Confucius found himself trapped between Tron and Tai, and for ten days he had nothing to eat, at times not even wild greens, and was very hungry. His disciple Tzu Lu secretly brought back a cooked pig, and Confucius did not ask where it came from. He just took it and ate. Tzu Lu also stole clothes from others in exchange for wine, and Confucius, without asking, opened it and drank. However, when Lord Lu Ai came to fetch him, Confucius showed the demeanor of a true gentleman. He would not sit on a mat that was not straight, nor eat meat that was not properly cut. Seeing this, Tzu Lu asked, Why do you seem different now compared to those difficult days trapped between Tron and Tai? Confucius replied, Back then, I acted out of necessity for survival. Now, I do this to teach proper conduct. 31. Softness Overcomes Hardness A Lesson from Laozi's Teacher The teacher of Laozi, known as Chang Tong, was extremely wise and had unique ways of explaining things. One day, Laozi visited his sick teacher. Chang Tong opened his mouth for Laozi to look inside and asked, Do you see any teeth left? No, master, all your teeth are gone, Laozi replied, shaking his head. How about my tongue? Chong Tung stuck out his tongue and asked, It's still there. Master, your tongue is still here, Laozi answered. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Chong Tung asked. The hard is gone, only the soft remains. Laozi thought for a moment, then slowly responded, Excellent, that's exactly it. Chang Tung happily confirmed. Under his teacher's guidance, Laozi realized that softness can overcome hardness, which is the essence of the principle, the soft overcomes the hard. 32. The Last Day There was a person who traveled with a pilgrim to visit a wise man living in seclusion. Upon meeting the wise man, the traveler asked, if you had only one day left to live, what would you do? The wise man, stroking his long, pure white beard slowly, replied, Well, first I would write poetry, then have some tea. Afterward I'd go to the yard to weed, maybe take a walk to see the neighbors, and then probably take a little nap. Hold on a second, the pilgrim interjected. Those are your everyday activities. Exactly, the wise man said. Why should the last day be any different from any other day? The last day of life is more meaningful than all other days because it is the day of death, and it lurks silently among the 365 days of a year, unusually quiet with no one knowing where it hides. 33. Where to go next? There was a student of a philosopher who was very curious about everything he saw, he always wondered or questioned others about this and that. One day, this student noticed his teacher seemed tired, so he said, Teacher, I know you won't be around much longer, but before you leave this body, may I ask you one question? Otherwise, it will bother me for the rest of my life. The teacher, puzzled, tried to open his eyes to look at his student and asked, What is it? The student replied, After you pass to the other side, where will you go? The teacher then said, Why do I need to go anywhere? After saying this, the teacher closed his eyes and passed away. Why do I need to go anywhere? The student repeated, dissatisfied with the answer. In fact, 
The wise teacher had given a very profound answer, but understanding it requires a high level of insight. Why do I need to go anywhere implies that the wise teacher is already everywhere. There is no need to go anywhere else. 34. Habit There was a young man who was so desperate to become rich that it drove him crazy. Every time he heard about a get-rich-quick scheme, he would rush to find it. One day, he heard about an old man with white hair living deep in the mountains who could make wishes come true for those fortunate enough to meet him. So the young man stayed up all night packing his bags and set off at dawn. After five long days, he finally met the old man. He asked the old man for treasures and wealth to make him rich. The old man told him, Every morning before the sun rises, go to the sandbank outside the village and look for the wish stone. This stone is different from ordinary stones. It glows and feels warm. Find it, and your wish will come true. Grateful, the young man hurried home. Each morning he went to the riverbank sandbank, throwing away any stone that did not glow or feel warm. After more than half a year, he still hadn't found the wish stone. Then one day, while searching as usual and discarding stones, he suddenly cried out, Oh! He burst into tears because, out of habit, he had thrown the glowing, warm wish stone into the river before realizing it was warm. 35. Three Times Preaching A famous monk once traveled to a small town for the first time. Despite it being his first visit, everyone in town knew of his reputation. Excited about his arrival, they eagerly invited him to give a sermon. The monk modestly responded, I'm just a simple person, and I fear my teachings might confuse you all. I'd rather not preach. Despite his refusal, the townspeople persisted and awaited eagerly. Left with no choice, the monk agreed, All right, I'll give a sermon this Friday. What topic would you like me to discuss? Everyone unanimously requested, About God, of course. Come Friday, the whole town gathered, cheering as the monk stepped up to the pulpit. He began by asking, Do you know what I'm going to talk about regarding God? Surprised, the crowd replied, No, what are you going to teach us? The monk said, Then there's nothing more to say. Since you aren't prepared, even if I explained, it would be pointless. This topic is complex and requires prior understanding. With that, he left the pulpit, leaving everyone puzzled. The next Friday, the monk returned and asked again, Do you know what I am about to say? This time, everyone answered, Yes. The monk replied, If you already know, then there's no need for me to speak. It would just be a waste of time. And again, he left. The townspeople, more baffled than ever and nearing frustration, persuaded him to come back once more. The following week, the monk returned and posed the same question. This time, half the crowd said, yes, and the other half said, no. The monk concluded, then let those who know tell those who don't, and left the pulpit once again. 36. Patience and Clarity, A Lesson from the Stream Once, a teacher and his student were walking through a forest in the middle of a hot afternoon. The teacher felt thirsty and told his student to go back to the stream they had just crossed and bring some water. When the student returned to the stream, he found it too small and muddy from vehicles that had recently passed, making the water undrinkable. He returned and informed his teacher, suggesting they continue walking to a river not far ahead to get clean water instead. The teacher insisted on using water from the small stream. Despite the student's frustration, knowing the water was dirty and feeling thirsty himself, he obeyed. After his teacher asked him to check the stream again, the student found the water clear and clean on his third visit as the mud had settled. Overjoyed, he brought the water back to his teacher. Kneeling, the student expressed his gratitude for the valuable lesson. Nothing is permanent, and with patience, all difficulties can be overcome. 
Like the stream, which eventually cleared itself of mud and debris, problems can resolve naturally if left undisturbed. The student then asked if there was anything he could have done the first two times to clear the water. The teacher replied that he needed to do nothing but wait. Any interference would have kept the water muddy. Water flows on its own, and in time it clears naturally. 37. Gratitude There were five foolish people carrying a huge boat on their heads as they entered a town. The townspeople were incredibly surprised. The boat was so big that it looked like it could crush them. Why were they carrying it? A local approached them and asked, What are you doing? One of them replied, We can't leave this boat behind. It's because of this boat that we were able to get here. How can we just abandon it? Without it, we wouldn't have made it here. We would have died on the other shore. We will never leave this boat. Carrying it on our heads is our simplest way of showing gratitude. 38. The Clever Dream Interpreter Once there was an emperor who had a dream that all his teeth had fallen out. Upon waking up, he immediately called for a dream interpreter to explain the meaning of his dream. Oh, what a misfortune, said the interpreter. Each lost tooth represents the death of a loved one. What? How dare you? The emperor shouted angrily. You dare to bring me such bad news? Get out! He then ordered, Guards, give him fifty lashes. Not long after, another interpreter came. After hearing about the emperor's dream, he said, Your majesty, you are very fortunate. You will live longer than all your relatives. Pleased, the emperor replied, Excellent. I will reward you with fifty gold coins. Follow my servant to collect your reward. On the way to collect his reward, the servant asked the interpreter, Why was your interpretation different from the first one? The interpreter answered, The same problem can have many different interpretations. It all depends on how you present it. He then happily took the gold coins and went home. 39. The Fourth Path a father took his three children through an orchard, and upon seeing the ripe fruits on the trees, he was tempted to steal some. He instructed his children to stand guard at three different paths leading into the orchard. While he was picking the fruit, one of his children spoke up, Dad, there's still one path left unguarded. Surprised, the father asked, What other path is there? There are only three paths leading here. The child replied, there's also the path that leads to heaven. Hearing this, the father felt embarrassed and ashamed. He threw away all the fruit he had picked and quickly led his children back home. 40. Practice makes the master. A tale of humility and skill. Long ago, there was a man named Tron Nghiu Tu who was an expert archer considered the best shooter of his time. Every time Ung Yu Tu practiced his archery, many people would come to watch. His shooting skills were indeed remarkable. He not only hit the target every time, but also with great force, earning applause from everyone. However, there was one old man selling oil who shook his head, indicating his disbelief. Seeing this, Tron Yu Tu asked, Can you shoot an arrow? The oil seller shook his head and replied, Although you are very good, there's nothing special about it. In my opinion, it's just because you are used to it. This comment angered Nihyu too, who said, Old man, you don't even know how to shoot, and yet you belittle others. What is the reason for this? Please calm down, young man, the old man responded calmly and fearlessly. I am an oil seller. I can pour oil without spilling a single drop. If you don't believe me, I'll show you. He then placed a gourd on the ground, put a coin on its mouth, and carefully poured oil through a small hole in the middle of the coin. He filled the gourd without getting a single drop of oil on the coin. See, doing this isn't anything special either. It's just the result of practice, the oil seller said, looking up and smiling at Nungyu too. From that day on, 
and Hugh too no longer boasted about his skills. 41. The Magical Stone Soup In a small village, a man dressed in odd clothes told some women that he had a magic stone. He claimed that if he boiled it in water, it would turn into a delicious soup. Skeptical but curious, the women gathered a large pot, a barrel of water, and some wood, and set up a cooking area in the village square. The strange man carefully placed the stone in the pot of water, stirred it a bit, and then tasted the broth. Nodding in approval, he suggested, Hmm, it's good, but it would be even better with a bit of onion. Immediately, someone ran home to fetch some onions. After adding the onions, the man tasted it again and exclaimed, Delicious, but it would be even more flavorful with a bit of meat. Soon, another villager brought some meat. If we add some vegetables, it would be perfect, the man suggested next. As the cooking continued, villagers brought salt, sauce, and more ingredients. Finally, when everyone sat down to enjoy the soup, they realized it was the best they had ever tasted. The stone was just an ordinary rock the man had found on the road. The story shows that by willingly contributing a part, everyone can create something wonderful together. When you contribute to a collective effort, the spirit of the stone soup stays in everyone's heart. 42. Daughter and Daughter-in-Law Two women were chatting in the park when one asked the other, How's your son doing? Oh, don't even ask, it's so unfortunate, the other woman sighed. He's truly miserable. He married a lazy woman who doesn't cook, clean, do laundry, or take care of the kids. She just eats and sleeps all day. Every morning, my son has to prepare food and bring it to her in bed. After saying this, she started crying profusely. After a while, she turned and asked, And how's your daughter? The woman brightened up and replied, My daughter is really lucky. She married a great guy who doesn't make her do any housework. He does everything from cooking, cleaning, laundry to taking care of the kids. And on top of that, he brings her breakfast in bed every morning. 43. Fire. In a workshop, various tools were discussing how to handle a piece of hard metal. The axe, full of bravado, said, Let me handle this. I'll take care of it quickly. So, it swung at the metal, but soon became dull and chipped without making any impact on the metal. Maybe I should try, the saw said eagerly, and began biting into it with its teeth, but soon both its teeth and blade broke. Then the hammer laughed and said, You guys are useless. Step back. Let me do it. It started pounding, creating a deafening noise. After a while, the hammer too was damaged, and the metal was still unchanged. Can I try? said a small flame standing nearby. Nobody paid much attention to it, but it moved closer to the metal. Gently, the flame heated it continuously. Over time, under its heat, the metal gradually turned red and finally melted. 44. Lightning One night, a skilled philosopher and an ordinary person found themselves lost in a deep, dangerous forest filled with ferocious wild animals and surrounded by darkness. The weather was turning stormy, and the wind was howling when suddenly a flash of lightning lit up the dark clouds. In that brief moment, the philosopher looked up at the sky while the ordinary person focused on observing the path. Opportunities come and go quickly, and just like that, the lightning vanished. If you're not paying attention, you might miss your chance. 45. The Mentor a wise man was about to introduce a mentoring professor to a group of students who were eagerly awaiting to meet this great mentor. However, instead, the wise man pulled out a rock and said, This is my mentor. It turns out, one day while walking, he found a rock in his shoe which he couldn't ignore and had to remove. As he sat down to take it out, he noticed how beautiful the path he walked every day actually was, and suddenly appreciated the wonders of life. 
Thanks to this rock, I've come to understand many things, the wise man explained. It turns out that the rock that caused him pain in his shoe had actually opened his mind to new insights. In life, sometimes the things that hurt us are the very things that bring us happiness. 46. The Joy of Fish Zhuangzi and Huizi were standing on the Hao River Bridge. Zhuangzi watched the fish swimming below and said, Look at the fish. They swim so freely and seem so happy. Huizi asked, You are not a fish. How do you know they are happy? Zhuangzi replied, You are not me. How do you know that I don't know the fish are happy? 47. Which foot goes first? Philosopher Frog was intensely watching Centipede walk with its hundreds of legs and became very curious. He wondered to himself, Walking with four legs is tough enough. How does Centipede manage with hundreds? The more he thought about it, the more baffled he became. How does Centipede decide which foot to move first, then the next, and then the next, especially with so many legs? So, he stopped Centipede to ask, I'm a philosopher, and there's one thing I can't figure out. You have so many legs. How do you know which foot goes first and which comes next? Walking with so many legs at once seems unbelievable. Centipede replied, I've always walked this way and no one has ever asked me this before. Now that you've asked, let me think about it and I'll get back to you. This was the first time Centipede had ever thought about this, and it quietly asked itself, Which foot do I move first? It stood still for a few minutes, then wobbled a bit before collapsing and said to Frog, Maybe you should ask another Centipede. I've always walked this way and never had a problem. As for which foot goes first, I've racked my brain and still can't figure it out. Now I can't move at all. All hundred legs want to move at once. What should I do now? 48. Ideals and Reality Two hungry men were given a basket of fish and a fishing rod by an elderly man. One man took the basket while the other chose the fishing rod, thanked the elder, and left. The man with the fish cooked them immediately, eating them voraciously like a starving tiger, and soon the basket was empty. Not long after, he died of hunger next to the empty basket. The man with the rod struggled with hunger and tried to make it to the sea, but by the time he saw the distant shoreline, he had no strength left. He died staring bitterly at the sea. Later, another two hungry men visited the elder and received the same gifts, a rod and a basket of fish. Instead of dividing the gifts, they agreed to go to the sea together, only cooking one fish at a time to share. They made it to the coast and eventually started fishing for a living. Over the years, they built homes, started families, owned their boats, and led happy lives. The first two men either focused too narrowly on immediate benefits or set goals too far beyond their reach, neither adapting well to life's realities. Only the last pair combined their ideals with reality, and both succeeded. Sometimes common wisdom really does make one think. 49. The Average Standard Once there was a king who owned a stunning gold bed adorned with thousands of extremely valuable gemstones. Whenever guests visited the royal palace, the king generously offered them the chance to sleep on this bed. However, the guests had to physically alter themselves to fit it. If a guest was too tall, they would have to reduce their height by cutting off a bit to fit perfectly into the bed. Since the bed was a priceless treasure, it could not be modified, so it was the user who had to adjust. One might say the bed wasn't made for the user. Rather, people were meant to fit the bed. Finding someone suitable for this special bed wasn't simple. And in fact, it was impossible because no one had the exact average height the bed was based on. Such a person was merely fictional. The bed was made based on this average measurement. The king, who was also a mathematician, had meticulously calculated and crafted this unique bed. 
he measured the height of everyone in the kingdom, children, adults, the elderly, including both short and exceptionally tall people. But this average didn't match anyone's actual height, so every guest at the palace faced the same problem with the precious bed. If a guest was shorter than the bed, the king would order them to be stretched to fit. As a result, all guests who lay on this bed eventually died, but it wasn't seen as the king's fault. He always offered the best to his beloved guests. When you view life with a fixed mindset, you miss out on what life truly is. Life is infinite and cannot be confined to any framework. Therefore, no single definition can decide the world or life itself. Indeed, your philosophy might encompass an aspect of life, but only that aspect. Thus, if you apply this philosophy to view the world as a whole, you are losing the connection between you and life. 50. Reflections Behind Bars Inmates Dream of Better Lives for Their Mothers In a high-security prison, a group of inmates gathered during their designated reading time. One prisoner, while flipping through a jewelry magazine, pointed at a lavish necklace and sighed, My mom would look so beautiful wearing this. Another, looking at a home decor magazine, remarked, My mom would be so happy living in a place like that. A third, browsing a car magazine, mused, If my mom had this car, she'd visit me more often. Silence fell when another prisoner, who had been quietly reading for a long time, suddenly teared up and choked out, It would have been great if I had been a good son to my mom. Everyone around him lowered their heads in a moment of reflection. 51. The Millionth Stone After a long time of searching for gems by the river, exhausted and worn out, a man sat on a large rock near the riverbank. He spoke to his friend beside him. Look, I've picked up 999,999 stones and still haven't found a single gem. I give up, his friend joked. Why not try one more stone to make it a million? Reluctantly, the man reached for another stone, only to feel it was heavier than usual. Upon closer inspection, he exclaimed in amazement, A gemstone! 52. The Fisherman King's Son there once was a skilled fisherman revered by all as the fisherman king due to his exceptional fishing techniques. However, in his later years he grew saddened by the fact that his three sons only had mediocre fishing skills, despite his best efforts to teach them. He often shared his worries with others, saying, I don't understand why I'm so good at fishing, yet my sons are not. I taught them everything. When they were young, I showed them the basics, like where to place the nets to catch the most fish, how to row the boat without scaring the fish, and the right moment to cast the nets. As they grew older, I taught them how to read the tides and about different types of fish. I didn't hold back any of my years of experience and shared it all with them, but they still can't match my skills. After hearing him out, someone asked, Do you help them every time they set the nets? He replied, yes, to ensure they learn the techniques well. The person then asked, do you go with them every time they head out to sea? Again, he said, yes, to make sure they don't get lost, I always guide them. The person then pointed out, that's where you've gone wrong. You've only taught them the techniques, but haven't let them apply these on their own. A person who only knows theory but can't put it into practice is like someone without experience. They can't become proficient that way. 53. The Gardener of God A farmer worked hard every day, plowing and watering his barren, rocky land. Thanks to his diligence and relentless labor, the desolate land eventually turned into a lush garden. He felt proud and happy. One Sunday morning, on his way to the garden as usual, he met an official and asked if he would like to see his garden. The official agreed. Entering the melon patch and seeing the juicy, round melons, the official exclaimed, Oh, God must have blessed this land. Then, seeing the rice field heavy with grains, he remarked, Wow, God really blessed these rice grains. 
He added, My goodness, you and God have achieved so much on this land. Unable to hold back, the farmer responded, Dear sir, I wish you could have seen what this place was like when God was managing it on his own. 54. The Wisdom of Laozi, Choosing Between the Brick and the Stone The story goes that when the philosopher Laozi rode his blue ox through the Hangu Pass, he met a very old man with white hair who was over 100 years old. The old man bowed to Laozi and said, I've heard that you are very wise and learned. Please teach me a few things. The old man proudly shared, I am 106 years old. Honestly, since my youth, I have lived a life of ease. All my peers are gone. They cleared hundreds of acres of land, had vast gardens but ended up with nothing, built grand structures but didn't enjoy any luxury, constructed homes but ended up buried in forgotten graves outside the city. As for me, I've never farmed, yet I've always had food. I've never built with bricks, yet I've lived in a home that shelters me from the wind and rain. Now, can I not laugh at their busy, troubled lives even though they died young? Laozi smiled and said, Please bring me a brick and a stone. When they were brought, Laozi placed them in front of the old man and asked, if you had to choose just one, which would you pick, the brick or the stone? The old man confidently chose the brick and explained, This stone is smooth and edgeless. It's useless. The brick, however, is useful. Laozi then turned to the crowd and asked, Would you choose the stone or the brick? Everyone chose the brick over the stone. Laozi looked back at the old man and asked, which lasts longer, the stone or the brick? The old man replied, Obviously, the stone. Laozi then calmly said, The stone lasts longer, but people don't choose it. The brick is short-lived, but people choose it because it's useful. It's the same with all things. Things that are short-lived but useful are preferred and liked. Those that last longer but are useless are overlooked and forgotten. Hearing this, the old man felt deeply embarrassed. 55. The Merchant and the Old Fisherman One day, a merchant saw an old man fishing at the end of a boat. Every time the old man caught a fish, he would remove the hook and then release the fish back into the water. Curious, the merchant asked, Why do you let them go instead of taking them home? The old man replied, What would I do with them at home? You could eat them, the merchant suggested. I only eat three fish a day. I don't need more, the old man explained. Then you could sell them at the market, the merchant continued. Sell them? Why would I sell these few fish, the old man questioned skeptically. You could make some money by selling them, the merchant answered. What do I need more money for, the old man asked again. You could use it to buy a bigger boat, the merchant felt puzzled. And what would I do with a boat? The old man remained calm. You could enjoy sitting on the boat fishing at your leisure, the merchant enthusiastically replied. So, do you think I'm not comfortable now? asked the old man. At this, the merchant didn't know how to respond. Sometimes only you can feel whether you're truly happy or not. Material success is just for others to see, not necessarily for yourself. It was a hot day, and the grass in the Zen garden had all dried up. Get rid of this ugly grass, a young monk said. Wait for cooler weather, his master responded with a wave of his hand, as time allows. At mid-autumn, the master bought a bag of grass seeds, and the young monk went to sow them. Suddenly, an autumn wind blew, scattering the seeds. Oh no, many seeds have blown away, the young monk exclaimed. It's okay. Those were the weaker seeds that wouldn't have sprouted anyway, the master replied. It's a waste. The remaining seeds have been eaten by birds. The young monk stomped his foot in anger. No worries. There are plenty of seeds, more than the birds can eat, the master continued reading his scripture. As it happens, at midnight, clouds gathered quickly, and a heavy rain washed away the seeds. 
In the morning, the young monk rushed into the meditation room. Master, this time it's ruined. All the seeds have been washed away. Wherever they've flowed, they will sprout, the master continued his meditation, eyes still closed. Let it be. Over half a month later, the empty yard had sprouted many fresh green shoots, even in places where seeds hadn't been sown, bringing joy to the young monk who clapped his hands. The master nodded in approval. Let it be joyful. The old master seemed always calm, truly understanding the profound meaning of life's philosophy. Why do our hearts often get troubled by external factors, leading to anxiety, fear, or even despair? Is it because achievements and victories cloud our judgment? 56. Flowers Bloom in the Wasteland In front of Van San Temple, there was a barren wasteland where nothing could grow. Before Master Tom Min, no one valued this land, no one thought it could be beneficial, and no one believed that one day it could become a beautiful garden. Master Tom Min, who was blind, did not want the land to remain a wasteland forever. After becoming a monk, and while other monks were busy reading scriptures and aspiring to be leaders, he took a hoe and started to cultivate the land. With each strike of the hoe, he planted seeds of flowers. Day after day, whenever he had free time, he would work tirelessly on that wasteland, and those who could see thought he was crazy. However, while others mocked and sneered at his efforts, the seeds that Master Tom Min planted began to sprout and grow. One spring night, all the flowers bloomed magnificently, and the monks at the temple rushed out to see them, stunned by the sight of the beautiful, colorful flowers. Only Master Tom Min remained calm. Being blind, no matter how beautiful the flowers were, he could not see them. His reason for turning the wasteland into a garden was to let others enjoy it and to show everyone that, in the eyes of a blind man, there really is no wasteland. 57. The Perfect Woman There was a man who lived his whole life single because he was searching for the perfect woman. When he was 70, someone asked him, You've traveled everywhere from Kabul to Kathmandu, from Kathmandu to Goa, from Goa to Punaka, Going to so many places, haven't you found the perfect woman yet? The old man sadly replied, Yes, once I did meet a perfect woman. The person asked, What happened then? Why didn't you marry her? The old man said with sorrow, How could I? She was also looking for the perfect man. 58. Flowers Bloom on the Buddha's Altar before sunrise, while the spring grass outside the temple was still dewy, a young man was kneeling in repentance. Master, please forgive me, he pleaded. He was a once carefree adventurer who, twenty years ago, had been a beloved novice in the temple. His mentor had taught him everything he knew, hoping he would become an outstanding Buddhist disciple. But one night, he was drawn back to worldly desires and secretly left the mountain. The dazzling city life captivated him, leading him to live a reckless life. Decades of indulgence felt like eternal spring, yet not quite. Twenty years later, one night, he suddenly realized the error of his ways. The clear moonlight outside his window seemed to cleanse his soul. Full of remorse, he quickly rode back to the temple. Master, Forgive me and accept me as your disciple once again. His mentor, disliking his reckless nature, shook his head. No, you have sinned gravely. You belong in the deepest hell, and only the Buddha can forgive you unless, he pointed at the Buddha's altar, even the Buddha's altar blossoms with flowers. Disheartened, the young man left. The next morning, the mentor entered the temple to find the altar covered in large, fragrant pink and white flowers. The temple was still, without a breeze, yet the flowers seemed to beckon. Realizing something profound, the mentor hurried down the mountain to find the young man, but it was too late. 59. Archery Skills 
A young man named Thuong Duong wanted to learn archery. He had heard that the world's best archer, known as Du Long Tu Chu, was living deep in the mountains. Everyone knew of Du Long Tu Chu's fame, although he was said to have a very peculiar temperament. There were countless intriguing stories about him, but whenever Thuong Duong asked if anyone had seen Du Long Tu Chu or knew how to find him, everyone just shook their heads, indicating that these were just hearsay. Determined to find the archer, Thuong Duong packed his bags and headed into the deep mountains. After wandering the forest for over a year looking wild with unkempt hair and torn clothes, he still hadn't found Du Long Tu Chu. However, he didn't give up and continued his search. Stop! Don't move! Suddenly, a voice called out. It had been over a year since Thuong Duong had heard another human. He saw an old man in front of him, dirty and holding a large bow with an arrow pointed straight at him. I've encountered robbers, Thuong Duong thought. Then he heard a swoosh sound as an arrow flew past his ear. A panther fell from above right behind him, making a loud growl. That's when Thuong Duong realized the old man wasn't a robber but had saved his life. He hurried to thank the man. Thank you for saving my life. Saved your life? I didn't save you, the old man replied, dismissing the notion with his bow. I shot that panther because I wanted its fur for a cushion, not to save you. Thuong Duong looked at the bow in the old man's hand, then at the dead panther with an arrow between its eyes, so powerful it looked like the panther had grown feathers on its head. This must be Du Long Tu Chu, he thought. You must be Du Long Tu Chu, the world's greatest archer. I've been looking for you for over a year. Please take me as your disciple. I'm not the greatest master, and I don't like teaching, the old man responded. If you want to learn archery, I'll tell you a story instead. He then recounted a tale of a king who went hunting and became indecisive when presented with multiple targets, ultimately catching none. Thuong Duong bowed deeply and said, I understand. He bid farewell to the old man and built a small hut to live in. From then on, he dedicated himself to archery. Thinking only of the target, his focus was unyielding, and he became a master archer, hitting his mark with every shot. 60. The Rice Merchant in the Tang Dynasty, in Guanglang of Jiangyang, there was a rice merchant who had spent his whole life dealing in trade and money. He had never practiced any spiritual disciplines or known any magic. Yet, at the end of his life, he attained enlightenment and left this world peacefully. His name was engraved on a stone wall at the Xianjia Cave. It's intriguing how someone who did not practice spiritual disciplines could become a celestial being. Let's delve into his story. In Zhangyang, there was a family that made their living by selling rice. The business of rice trading was passed down to Li Jiak, who inherited the family enterprise. Known for his integrity, meticulous work ethic, and diligence, Li Jiak was a bit more remarkable than others. By the age of 15, Li Jiak joined his father in business. As his father was busy with other business matters, he entrusted Li Jiak with the responsibility of selling rice. Whenever someone came to buy rice, he would give them a measure and ask them to scoop it themselves. The price of rice changed with the seasons, but Li Jiak never calculated his sales based on seasonal prices. He made a tiny profit of just two coins per measure, barely enough to support his elderly parents. Li Jiak's business approach seemed foolish, as he missed out on opportunities to make more money and never engaged in deceit or trickery to make a quick profit, unlike other rice merchants. However, after several years, his family's economy was unaffected. On the contrary, they prospered without worry for basic necessities. One day, his father realized how much the family's fortunes had improved and asked Lai Jiak about his management practices, wondering how they could make so much money. Li Jiak honestly shared his methods with his father, 
His father was amazed and said, There are many rice merchants like us. When selling, they use a smaller measure, and when buying, a larger one, hoping to gain a bit more, make a bit more money. When we do business, we use the same measure for both buying and selling, believing it to be fair and free of deceit. Today, you allow the customers to measure their own rice, and I truly can't compare with you. Even so, our family lie continues to thrive economically. Isn't this divine help? Later in life, after his parents passed away, and he was 80, Li Jiak was still managing the family business. A high-ranking official, who had the same name, Li Jiak, which was considered inauspicious to share, prompted him to change his name to Li Kaon. After the official, now a prime minister, moved to Huainan, he had a vivid dream. He saw himself entering a cave adorned with fireworks and flying phoenixes, colorful clouds, and continuous palaces. As he walked further, he saw many names carved on a stone wall and found his own among them. The prime minister was overjoyed and thought, I was born in the royal court, have achieved great military feats, and now as a prime minister, I have served the realm well. How could I not have accumulated virtue? Seeing my name engraved here, I must also be a celestial being. Just then, a celestial figure approached the stone wall and clarified, This is Huayang Cave, and the name does not refer to you, but to a common man under your jurisdiction. Upon waking, the Prime Minister recalled the vivid dream and was amazed. He sent people to find out who the celestial person sharing his name was. Eventually, someone from the neighborhood informed him that Lai Kon's real name was Li Jiak, and the Prime Minister quickly invited him over. After a formal meeting and a thorough cleansing, the Prime Minister revered Lai Jiak as a spiritual elder. He shared his dream and asked Lai Jiak about the magic he practiced, or the miraculous elixirs he drank, hoping to learn some techniques. Since Lai Jiak had never practiced any spiritual disciplines or magic, he honestly replied, All my life, I've only sold rice. The Prime Minister repeatedly asked, but Lai Jiak maintained, I'm just an ordinary merchant. I know nothing about such practices. Understanding the doubts in the Prime Minister's mind, Li Jiak shared his experience in rice selling, emphasizing that he did not focus on personal gains or losses, always considering his customers' benefit first. The Prime Minister exclaimed, It is truly difficult for an ordinary person to act as you do. If you can achieve this, it indeed constitutes great moral virtue. Li Jiak lived a simple life intertwined with his business, facing daily temptations but maintaining his good nature. He was always calm, kind, and serene. His appearance, with a long beard, resembled that of a sage. Lai Jiak lived to be over 100 years old, passing away peacefully. According to folklore, three days after his death, his coffin split open, and when people looked inside, his body had disappeared, much like a cicada shedding its skin, leading to beliefs that he had attained celestial status. Hey everyone, your comments truly matter, offering insights and motivation to others and uplifting our creative team at Lighthouse of Wisdom Channel. Sharing your thoughts and experiences enriches our community. So let's get the conversation started below and help illuminate our path with your wisdom.